My name is Ray Urbanic. I'm a professional engineer and VP of engineering for Southwest Electric Company. We're a private uh, custom manufacturer of transformers and switch gear, as well, well as a repairer of motors and provide all kinds of uh, field services for a variety of uh, electrical equipment. I'm here to talk to you about ArcFlash and how to read an ArcFlash uh, assessment report what kind of information you can find out about it and how you can use that information to help you at the facility you're at. So if you are ready, we'll get started. So what is arc flash? Arc flash happens when current flows in a direction it's not supposed to, usually through air instead of through a conductor. This occurs when usually 96% of the time or greater based on statistics. This occurs when an individual interferes with that flow of current and causes this arc flash to occur. Uh, the results, as you can tell from these photos, can be disastrous. Uh, the photo on the left was a gentleman who was trying to tighten bolts on a power bus that he thought was de-energized. Unfortunately, it was not, and so therefore, it arced through his wrench and his body to ground. Uh, the result was not only the arc flash explosion and the damage done to the equipment, but also the glove he was wearing was not arc flash rated and actually uh, melted itself into his hand. Uh, fortunately, he was able to survive, but with significant uh, burn marks on his body. The gentleman on the right was a contractor we hired in order to install some conduit. Uh, he thought the panel board he was, in, he was working on was also de-energized. It was not. And a piece of metal that he dislodged fell across the live terminals and ground, also caused an explosion. You can tell the one side of his shirt is burnt and tattered because that was the half of the shirt that was exposed to the front of the panel board. Fortunately, he was standing on the side, so his entire body was not burned, but he also experienced significant burns on his, all, all over his torso. Fortunately, he also survived, but both of these uh, gentlemen experienced life-altering events. This happened many, many years ago when we were first understanding what Arc Flash was, and we have since educated ourselves as a company, and now we want to educate others on it. During an arc fault, you probably have, may have seen some videos and explosions. What's actually happening is because this current is flowing through air instead of through a conductor, and instead of being controlled and directed properly, the amount of current that is involved increases dramatically. Uh, because of this high current in a very short amount of time, within 50 milliseconds, this intense heat that generates actually catches the cable insulation on fire, which in itself is intended to be fire resistant. But because of the heat, it's just overwhelming. After about 100 to 120 milliseconds, the actual solid copper conductor will begin to evaporate. Now, when water changes from a liquid to a gas, when it boils, it expands about a thousand times as a gas. When solid copper evaporates under this intense heat, it expands 67,000 times. You can just imagine the amount of overpressure that occurs. That's why you see the, this explosion. That's why you see shrapnel generally from these kinds of arc events because of that overpressure that's occurring when this conductor evaporates. And afterward, you usually don't see a uh, conductor. You see usually melted slags of remains. After about 200 milliseconds, if the arc is able to continue, if their protection is not sufficient to clear it, uh, you will just increase the amount of ionization, the amount of plasma, from the air and you would only add energy to this event at an exponential rate. Because of the seriousness of these events and the catastrophic 
nature they have to equipment and the personnel, standards have been developed over the time. The NFPA is the National Fire Protection Association, and they developed a standard called NFPA 70E. Uh, the utility sector has developed their own safety standard called the NESC. Both of these standards specifically speak to electrical safety and concentrate on these arc flash events and how to prevent them and how to clear them. These standards now apply to virtually every facility within the US. OSHA uh, adopted these standards and now enacted them since 2014. These standards include these six steps of compliance that you see on your screen and every facility is required to follow these compliance steps. It's very possible that most facilities have some kind of safety program, but not all facilities have calculated their arc flash hazards and their energies. They also, because they don't have these values determined, they may not have the proper personal protective equipment or PPE in order to protect their workers. And then also the amount of training and tools required to prevent these kinds of accidents from occurring, protect danger to their employees, as well as have the proper warning labels on their equipment. So hopefully your facility has already underwent this assessment and have these steps in compliance. If they don't, then you wanna stay tuned and, and learn about these things so you can help your facility get up to speed. So how are these arc flash levels determined and how do we know what kind of protective equipment we need? Well, the arc, arc incident energy levels are calculated based on a complex set of equations that are developed and governed over IEEE standard 1584. That way these standards apply to all facilities equally and consistently. Once these equations are determined and the proper protective equipment is determined, this will keep personnel roughly safe based on the energy levels that they're going to be experienced from various equipment. This picture here gives you a, a visual on what kind of energies we're talking about. So the far left shows the very lowest energy levels regarding arc flash, 1.2 calories per square centimeter. Those are the units that they measure by. This is equates to a second degree burn. So it figure amount of heat that allow you to get a blister on your skin. That's what 1.2 calories per square centimeter represents. You can see that the energy levels increase from there. So you can only imagine uh, the amount of burns that could be a person could be exposed to without the proper equipment. And you can see as you increase in your energy level, you're increasing in your protective equipment to eventually almost looking like a firefighter or even a, a spaceman with some of the 40 cal suits that are available. The NFPA 70E points out that any energy level above 40 calories per square centimeter is considered dangerous. No amount of PPE is sufficient to protect that individual at energies above 40 calories per square centimeter. That not only because of the heat and flame, but also for the sheer force of shock, the amount of shrapnel can, that could be jettisoned during events of that nature, as well as uh, the amount of toxic fumes that can be generated. So therefore, and that's important to know as we go through this, 40 calories is the cutoff. Beyond that, uh, you, you really don't need to be exposed or have any of your employees exposed to energies that high. So what is an arc flash boundary? Uh, this is a distance that's been calculated and determined to keep individuals within a set distance to reduce that arc energy felt to no more than that 1.2 calories per square centimeter. So that arc, for let, arc flash protection boundary 
the outer edge of this bullseye that we show on the slide, that is for your general bystander, someone who's just trying to do their job, walk past a, a situation, basically in their street clothes. That distance will, will guarantee that individual should not see more than 1.2 calories per square centimeter should an arc event occur past some energized equipment that is exposed. Exposed meaning someone is actually working on that live equipment. The limited approach boundary requires a little bit more PPE. These are people who are trying to assist those who are working on the energized equipment, putting up blockades, putting up safety uh, reminders, putting up shock blankets in order to contain energy should an event occur. And then the restricted approach boundary obviously is the one who is working on the live equipment and they're going to be the one who's most likely suited up like like a fireman or a spaceman uh, you can tell on the table on the bottom right that the further away you are from the energized equipment that could experience an arc flash condition the less energy you're going to feel just like a campfire the closer you are to where the energized equipment is and could experience an arc flash the higher that instant energy level is going to be, the more PPE you need to have on. So how is this arc flash assessment conducted? So how, what, what happens? It all starts with data. We need a lot of data, thousands and thousands of data points that we need to essentially replicate mm -hmm. the electrical distribution system within a given facility and model it into a computer. So this involves getting all the one-line diagrams, electrical drawings of that facility. It involves verifying what the fault current levels from the supply and utility could possibly be, as well as documenting all the various different data points throughout the system, all the equipment, all the protection, all these settings. This process could take days, weeks, possibly months, considering how large your facility or your campus is. But this takes an extraordinary amount of time to verify all this equipment. Oftentimes, this equipment may be energized while this data is being collected, and individuals have to be suited up in order to obtain this information. Once all this is documented, this is fed into a computer model. As we're documenting this data into a model and building this representation of the electrical system, we're able to determine the amount of impedances and characteristics of that system, and then run numerous scenarios where we simulate an event at every single electrical bus throughout the system. When that arc event occurs, we then measure, calculate the response throughout the system, how long that arc may last based on the protection settings, the severity of that arc event, and so on. Based on all these scenarios and all this documented analysis, we can determine the worst case energy levels for each electrical bus throughout your system. Once all those scenarios are run and all that information is determined, this gives us an idea of what risks a facility may face during an ARC event. Once we have all those scenarios and all that data and analysis calculated in our software, then a report is generated and it tabulates all these results in a fairly easy to read format that we're gonna go over in just a few minutes. In addition, based on these results, an arc flash label is generated. That was one of the six steps of compliance from the NFPA 70E standards. On this label, and you see a, an example of it on your screen, that's going to let you know what specific bus it applies to, the amount of voltage that that bus operates at, and then all the characteristics. What, were, what was the instant energy level? What is the limited approach, the restricted approach, and arc flash boundaries? And when, what was the date that this 
arc flash event occurred or arc flash assessment occurred. So you know how old or how relevant that study is. Once these labels are affixed to all the appropriate equipment throughout your facility, training should also be followed up so that everyone in the facility knows what these labels mean, know what their values mean, so that everyone can stay safe around this equipment. Now, if you've ever seen an arc flash report and assessment, most of the time they're gonna be very large. They're gonna be probably over a hundred pages, there's going to be all kinds of different sections, all kinds of tables and charts and information that may or may not make sense. The whole point of this presentation is that we can make sense out of this and you know how valuable this information is and how to leverage it for your, your benefit. These, this report is going to contain, it's going to vary depending on provider of what each section, what order it comes in, what they're entitled. But for the most part, most assessments should contain the information you see on your screen. The first one's going to be the executive summary, and that's the first one we're going to start with and one of the most important ones. We're also going to look at the arc flash study results and the recommendations for mitigation. I consider these the three most crucial sections within this assessment. We are going to also glance through the rest of these sections at the very end. So the executive summary this is your bottom line. This is your uh, summary of what the findings were. Most of the time, the information through an assessment is going to, the majority of the analysis is going to reveal values that are considered fairly normal, fairly manageable, fairly easy to deal with. The executive summary is intended to highlight the items of interest, usually energy levels of a high nature, um, any findings they have of damaged equipment that they might have uncovered, uh, issues where protection is may not be sufficient or may be miscalibrated, uh, or they might even find uh, findings that they saw throughout their, their time in that facility another set of eyes where, hey, you know what, you might want to consider uh, this, these scenarios as being potential safety hazards, and you might want to address these as a recommendation. This is not to get anybody in, in trouble or to point fingers, it's simply to be helpful. Uh, any good arc flash assessment provider will do this service, be another set of eyes to keep a facility safe. So part of that, it, Summary is going to be these observ observations, short circuit study results, uh, the coordination results that are going that we're, we're going to analyze, as well as all the arc flash. So now we're going to talk about the arc flash table. Before we get into that, we're going to analyze what some of these columns in this table represent and why they're important. So first thing is the bus name. This is usually the piece of equipment in your facility that we are analyzing. If that piece of equipment were to have an arc event, what would happen? So we identify that piece of equipment. Every piece of electrical equipment will end up being identified in this assessment and should receive its own label. The trip delay time, sometimes called the clearing time in seconds, this is the amount of time the system requires to clear a given arc fault. That time is based on the coordination settings of either fuses or protective relays that are throughout the system that apply to wherever that arc fault could occur. The lower the time this is, usually the lower the incident energy will end up being. The arc flash boundary we talked about earlier that's the distance to keep non-authorized personnel who happen to be within the vicinity of exposed energized equipment, the distance they need to maintain it to keep that 1.2 calories or lower protection. And then obviously the most critical is what is the actual incident energy level that's been calculated should 
a buzz fault or a, an arc fault occur at this piece of equipment. Then the highlights of this section that we're going to look at is to highlight what the hot spots are. What are the incident energy levels that are the highest, especially those that are over the 40 calorie per square centimeter threshold. We also want to know where the location of this equipment is going to be. And we also want to perform a risk assessment. What's the traffic, foot traffic like around this equipment? Is this isolated where very few people ever come in contact with this equipment? Or do people walk by this constantly throughout the day? If an arc event were to occur suddenly, how many people could it affect at one time? So here's our typical arc flash results table. So we're going to do a little exercise. I want you to help me determine what are the items, what are the buses on this little section of a table that are of the most interest. This is actually from an arc flash assessment. These are true values that were recorded and calculated. So tell me what the three highest incident energy levels, again, that far right column, that you would want to look at first. Yes, obviously they're going to be the ones that are above 40 calories per square centimeter. So these are very high levels. You can tell if 1.2 causes a second degree burn, imagine what 125 calories per square centimeter would cause. These are extremely high levels, very dangerous to personnel. What I want you to notice now is what is the relationship between the high incident energy levels and the trip delay or clearing time for those potential faults? You can tell those, those high energy levels result from the highest trip or clearing times that are calculated. You can see that some are, the highest is gonna be two seconds and that comes from NFPA 70E. Two seconds is the given maximum amount of time that an individual would stand in front of an arc flash event. Usually the first instinct is to get away from there as quickly as possible. So they allow for no more than two seconds for someone to get out of that area. And that's why it's set at two seconds. What this tells me is that at these buses, the protective settings are insufficient to detect and clear an arc flash event should it occur. It maxed out at the two second level and that's what allowed all that incident energy to accumulate as we saw earlier in the previous slide. You can tell that the other clearing times are relatively small, usually within uh, 20, well, within 100, 170 milliseconds was the highest, or 70 milliseconds. Therefore, those clearing times are very small, and as a result, the incident energy is also very small. Now I want you to recognize the voltage level of these, these particular buses. They're all at the 480 volt level. 480 volts is 99 times out of 100 going to be the equipment that has the highest arc energy for any simulation, any assessment. You would think the higher voltage equipment would be more dangerous when it comes to arc flash. Actually, it's the 480 volt ends up being the most dangerous. That doesn't mean that all 480 volt equipment is dangerous, but based on conditions, based on event available energies, based on the protection, and that's the key is the protection at 480 usually is not sufficient to pick up these lower arc fault and current values. And because those are delayed, they build up into these high energy levels. So here's what I'd like you to do knowing this. I'd like you to go to your facility management or your maintenance department and see if you can get a hold of a copy of the arc flash assessment. Look at the arc results table. Where are the highest incident energy levels in your facility? What, what equipment is that? Can you locate that equipment? And then double check, does your facility have the proper PPE to handle these energy levels or do they have rules in place to not work on this equipment live at all? 
So these are the, the two critical areas in every arc flash assessment. But there's one more critical area I would like us to focus on. That's mitigation of this arc flash energy. You have all these high energy levels. What do you do about it? You don't really have to live with it. Most of the time, there are methods and capabilities to reduce this energy level and allow greater safety for your personnel. That first line on this slide is extremely important. The faster you can clear an arc fault upstream, the less incident energy you're going to see at your equipment level. And we saw that in, our, in the arc table just a few slides earlier. So the more energy that's reduced, the less damage you have to the equipment, certainly the less risk you have to personnel, and then you have less downtime for your equipment to be restored so you can resume production. All of this is called arc mitigation. There are plenty of different methods for mitigating arc energies. It can involve as simple as readjusting the settings of your current protection. It could be upgrading your current protection into something more modern and more selective. It could be upgrading your equipment altogether to have a different type of equipment that reacts to faults and is able to clear them faster than what you presently have. All of this is very complex at times, and it's certainly recommended that you talk to uh, a third party contractor who is experienced in arc mitigation. Southwest Electric is one of the things that we do quite often, and we would be happy to talk with anyone who wants to, but there are plenty of other contractors out there as well. So besides this critical information regarding the arc flash incident energy levels and possibly how to mitigate them, we also have other information included in this assessment. So you have all the protective settings throughout the electrical system, your fuse ratings, fuse curves, your relay settings, your breaker settings, all these are listed under the device inputs. This is very handy information that for your maintenance or your engineering departments to have if they ever wanted to do any kind of modification or upgrade in your facility, if they ever wanted to relook at the protection, or if they're trying to troubleshoot an issue. Very handy information to have that comes free with this arc flash assessment. Also, our system one lines. Many facilities do not have up-to-date drawings that show the electrical flow of their system, of their facility. This arc flash assessment generates this one line for free, essentially, because it's completely modeled within the software. And so this is also handy information for engineering and maintenance to have and utilize in all their equipment efforts. The arc flash assessment also includes some other study information that's very handy. One is the short circuit study. This verifies that based on all of these simulated faults throughout the system, based on the fault currents that are calculated, is the equipment seeing those faults rated high enough to handle and operate properly under those fault conditions. Quite often, older facilities have equipment at a certain fault level rating but then through time, through expansion, through upgrades, they can actually outgrow their protective equipment and actually see higher fault currents than their equipment is rated to handle. In, this, in these cases, that equipment usually has to be upgraded or even replaced. There's also a coordination study that is included in this assessment. This overlays all the different protective curves throughout a given circuit to make sure everything is coordinated so that the lowest level disconnect would trip first before a higher level disconnect or an upstream disconnect would trip. Think about it in your house. If you have an overload on a receptacle, you wouldn't want the main breaker to trip first. You would want just that breaker feeding that receptacle to trip 
and leave all the other loads maintained. Same thing here. A proper coordination study ensures that the lowest affected area would be tripped in order to clear any kind of fault that is detected. Okay, so this was a very quick summary of an arc flash assessment and the information that's included. Trust me, we could talk for several more hours on the contents of these assessments. So what should you do with this information that you've learned very quickly? Well, first, make sure you have an arc flash assessment for your facility. OSHA requires it for just about everyone in the US. So it's, it's essential that every facility have this assessment and calculate their arc energies and understand the risks that exist for their system and their personnel. If you do not have this arc flash assessment, nothing's been done at your facility, it's a good idea to let facilities leadership be, be made aware. Once you have this report, get your hands on it, study it. Take a look at that arc flash table. Look at the incident energy levels that are there. What are the highest energy levels? Where are those equipment located? How many, how many personnel are generally around that equipment? Those are important questions to answer. And you wanna make sure that all the sections are actually included in that assessment, including recommendations for mitigating that arc energy. If you do not have recommendations on how to mitigate arc energy and you have high levels, especially those over 40 calories, I highly recommend you do not live with those energies. You reach out to a contractor who's experienced with mitigation and ask them for the recommendations. Most of the time, their assessments and their quotations are free and something you can uh, consider budget around. Again, Southwest Electric does this kind of work quite often and we would be happy to talk with anyone who needs our assistance. And then you want to review these findings with your facility leadership and figure out what can be done to lower these risks. And that's the end of the presentation. Um, I really appreciate your attention and I would love to hear from you if you have any further questions or if you find out some information and not quite sure how to interpret it. I'd be happy to answer whatever I can. Uh, you can see our website. You also see my contact information at the bottom. Love for you to reach out to me. Again, we are in the business of trying to help people get be more safe, have their facility more safe, have their equipment operating properly, and keep their production levels high. So we would love to hear from you. Hope you have a good day.